Would everyone please rise for the arrival of callers? Commander Arquella?
Hall. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Mr. Chris Berard from Canada singing the Canadian National Anthem. Chris. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons' command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, a true horse strong and free. From far and wide, O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God keep our land glorious and free. O Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Canada, we stand on God for thee. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> Ms. Jan McClellan from Folsom State Prison singing the national anthem. During the years of our newly formed nation, we fought many battles with the British. In 1813, the commander at Fort McHenry ordered that a large, a very large American flag be flown. He had to make it 30 by 40 feet. 1,200 square feet so that the British would see it far away. It was made out of fine wool and measured 1,200 square feet the size of a small house. Sure enough, 1814, as the British had captured Washington and set the capital on fire, at the same time, a young attorney was traveling across the country. He was going to negotiate with the British to release his friend. Francis Scott Key was stopped and put on a British ship. He was not allowed to get near Fort McHenry, where they were fighting a vicious battle. All night it was dark, and he wondered if that flag was still flying. Through the dark, all he could see was the bomb bursting in the air. Daylight came, and he looked through the smoke and the haze, and there it was. The flag was still flying. Then he spoke. Then in that hour of deliverance, my heart spoke. Does not such a country, such defenders of their country, deserve a song? So he took an envelope out of his pocket and started writing verses, four verses, in fact. It was called The Defense of Fort McHenry, later called The Star-Spangled Banner. And it wasn't until 1931 that our Congress adopted it as our national anthem. This anthem has been our theme song at every major sports event, inaugural, patriotic event. Then every American hears <clears throat> this song and sees the flag. They are led to stand and clasp their hand over their heart. May we ever be reminded of the battles fought and the lives shed, that we might prosper and we might have peace and freedom. As quoted from the fourth verse, Francis Scott Key said, then conquer we must, if our cause is just. And this be our motto, in God is our trust. And the star-spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave. Can you see by the dawn's early light? While so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the pale.
Thank you, Jan and Chris. Please be seated. Good morning. On behalf of the board of directors of the, and representatives of the Correctional Peace Officers Foundation, I welcome you to the 16th annual memorial service held as a part of Project 2000. My name is Larry Corby. For the past 11 years, we have been moving the memorial around to different sites in the nation to allow more correctional officers the opportunity to attend, participate, and learn more about the CPO Foundation. We are gathered at this most historic site, Fort Vancouver, to honor some of our true heroes, those men and women correctional professionals that gave their lives while on duty serving the public. Some of them lost their lives in tragic accidents, some during incidents, or were brutally murdered by a predatory incarcerated convict. Every fallen officer makes an impact on our profession. This memorial service is in gratitude to those who have served and in sorrow for those who have lost their lives. This, however, is not a time for tears, but a time to celebrate life. We will always remember and we will always be proud. Thanks to Peter Morangolo and the Correctional Captains Association of New York City and the individual members of the New York City Department of Correction Pipe Band for their attendance once again at our memorial service. You have all become an integral part of our memorial service and we welcome and thank you. Today we have correctional personnel from rank and file, from the supervisory class, and from management classifications. We have personnel from the federal system, from state systems, from county systems, the city systems, and from the wonderful country of Canada. We are all here to pay our respects to the families of those correctional professionals taken from us. In the line of duty, both here in the USA and as members of the military in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the rest of the world, we send our prayers to all of them. Freedom is worth fighting for. We in corrections live by that premise. We are family. I would like to introduce Correctional Officer Carswell and Correctional Officer Ruiz from the Correctional Rehabilitation Center in California singing Where Were You When the World Stopped Turning. Gentlemen. some stage in LA did you stand in shock when you heard of the bad news that your friend was taken away did you shout out in anger and fear for your partner or did you just sit down and cry did you weep for his children who lost their dear loved one pray for the ones you don't know Rejoice for people who walked from the job site and saw for the ones you're alone. Did you burst out and cried for the badge made of gold and the heroes that died just doing what they're told? Did you look up to heaven for some kind of answer and look at yourself and what really matters? I'm just a singer of simple songs. I'm not a real political man. I watch CNN, but I'm not sure I can tell you the difference that I'm walking around. But I know Jesus, and I talk to God, and I remember this from when I was young. Faith, hope, and love are some good things he gave us. And the greatest is love. Where were you when the world stopped turning on that judgment day? 
teaching a class full of innocent children or driving down some cold interstate? Did you feel guilty because you're a survivor? In a crowded room, did you feel alone? Did you call up your mother and tell her you love her? Dust off that old Bible at home. Did you open your eyes and hope it never happened? Close your eyes and not go to sleep. Did you notice the sunset for the first time in ages? Speak to some stranger on the street. Did you lay down at night and think of tomorrow, feeling like getting a gun? Did you turn off that violent old movie you're watching and turn on I Love Lucy rerun? Go to a church and hold hands with some strangers. Stand in line, lay down a rosebud. Did you just stay home and cling tight to your family? Thank God you have somebody to love. I'm just a singer of simple songs. I'm not a real political man. I want CNN, but I'm not sure I can tell you the difference in Iraq and Iran. But I know Jesus and I talk to God, and I remember this from when I was young. Faith, hope, and love are some good things he gave us, and the greatest is love. I'm just a singer of simple songs. I'm not a real political man. I watch CNN, but I'm not sure I can tell you the difference in Iraq and Iran. But I know Jesus and I talk to God. And I remember this from when I was young. Faith, hope, and love are some good things he gave us. And the greatest is love. The greatest is love. The greatest is love. Where were you when the world stopped turning on that judgment day? gentlemen, very beautiful. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the members of the Correctional Peace Officers Foundation Board of Directors. First, the Chairman of the Board, Mr. Glenn Mueller. Next is the Vice Chair of the Board, Mr. Richard Subia. Mr. Salo Suna. Mr. Richard Waldo, who also serves as the treasurer. Mr. Edgar Barcliffe. Mr. Tim Hill. And finally, myself, I also serve as the secretary. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce the chairman of the board of directors, Mr. Glenn Mueller. Glenn. Good morning. I want to thank every person that's out here for coming to this occasion. It is one great thing that we do, and that is to honor those that have sacrificed the ultimate. One of the things that I've always found that is the most important thing in life, it is not how much wealth you've done or collected or uh, what you aspire to, but the greatest things that I've ever got out of life, and I'm, true, I'm sure it's true in every family, and that is to say to my mother, I love you, and give her a hug, or to have one of my children hug me and say, I love you, Dad. I think those are a couple of the most important things that ever happens in anybody's life. And if there's one thing that I try to do every day, and that is to hug every one of them and tell them I love them, uh, 
there's times when I miss my father because he's not here. And I, and I think, you know what, the, that's one of the most important things that we can always do. And that's one of the things I'm going to do right after we're through with this thing here is I'm going to fly back to Minnesota and see my mother again and tell her one more time I, I love her. Uh, she's 93 years old. I don't know how much longer she's going to be around, but I, they, that, that to me has got to be the most important things to do in this world. So I want every one of you, just as, as time goes on in life, remember your family is the most important thing we have, and, we, and to let everybody know that you love each other, that's the one thing we need to do the most. I think that's the richest thing that you can give anybody. With that, thank you again. And thank you all for coming here. Thank you, Glenn. <clears throat> Next, we have the Regional Director, Western Regional Director of Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, Mr. William Stickman. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I just want to say it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to come here from Pennsylvania and see all you folks and be with you during this uh, memorial service. Um, the Gospel tells us there is no greater love than to lay down your life for a friend. Today, we're here to memorialize those who made this ultimate sacrifice. Those who have fallen in the service of their friends. In a larger sense, we're here to honor a much greater sacrifice. That these men and women laid down their lives, not only for the friends with whom they work, but for strangers, for you, for me, and for society. They lived and worked to protect society to do justice in a better, safer world, and they fell in its pursuit. It is altogether fitting, then, that we have come from across this great nation and from, for our friends from the North to express our sympathies to the family for their loss and our gratitude for their service. Few people outside of law enforcement understand the challenges faced each day by those in corrections. Few realize there is no such thing as an ordinary day behind the walls or behind the gates of our nation's correctional facilities. Corrections professionals work each day with the threat that the unthinkable could happen at, each, at any time. This threat is also well understood and borne by their families. When the worst does happen and tragedy does occur, it's a comfort to all of us to know that their families that, that can lean on their friends, families, and organizations such as the Correctional Peace Officers Foundation. When I was the superintendent at Pennsylvania State Correctional Institution at Green, I experienced firsthand the death of an officer in an unfortunate accident. I remember the grief and disbelief of both the staff and the family and the corrections community. I also remember the closeness and cohesiveness of the corrections family. The Corrections Peace Officers Foundation was there to respond quickly and bring help to those in need. Not only the family with monetary help, but support, and also the institution and the correctional family down there, they were there. Everyone at the institution was comforted by their attentiveness to their thoughts, prayers, and material goods. This is just one instance of the work that organizations like this do every day in every state of the union. This valuable service is appreciated by all in the extended corrections family. The best way that we can memorialize those that we're here today for, that gave the ultimate sacrifice in the line of duty, is to honor them in the way we do our own jobs. By working together as a team, corrections professionals can honor those who have fallen by ensuring that their sacrifice in pursuit of a just, safe society was not in vain. Finally, we can honor them by providing support to their families, their co-workers, and friends through organizations such as the Correction Officers Peace Foundation. Once again, thank you, and may God bless us all. Thank you, Mr. Stickman. Next, we have the, well, the warden of the Telford unit in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice, Mr. John Rupert. John? Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here this morning, and uh, it just touches my heart to see all of the the things that CPOF does for all the families of all the, uh, the officers that have given the ultimate sacrifice in performing their duties. It's just a wonderful organization and as a warden you get to see the direct benefit of CPOF when they 
uh, present to the families. They're there for their time of need. Um, we were able to do a bike ride across Texas uh, for CPOF for one of our uh, friends that lost his life training for that bike ride. And to see the way the CPOF came out for us, to support us at the Telford unit, to support his family in her time of need, uh, just touches my heart and it's such a, a privilege to be here today and uh, just couldn't be more proud of being associated with CPOF and all that they've done. Thank you. Thank you, Warden Rupert. Ladies and gentlemen, the New York City Department of Correction Pipe Band. Gentlemen. I would like to introduce Ms. Mandy Donaldson. Her father, William E. Bill Donaldson, was murdered while on duty at the West Jefferson Correctional Facility on January 12, 1990. The prison has since been renamed in Mandy's daddy's honor, the Donaldson Correctional Facility in Bessemer, Alabama. Each year, I like to mention that we are always very proud as correctional professionals when a state chooses to rename a correctional institution after one of our own who has lost his or her life in the line of duty. Many times a special building or unit that is frequented by staff is renamed in a fallen officer's memory. Again, Jennifer and Mandy, I know that you both feel very proud. Mandy has been participating and singing for us since 19 1992. Mandy? Made me make it through. Oh, I 
owe so much to you. You were right there for me. Cause in my dreams I'll always see you soar above the sky. And in my heart there'll always be a place for you for all my life. Cause I always saw with you my light, my strength And I wanna thank you now for all the ways You were right there for me And in my heart there'll always be a place for you for all my life. I'll keep a part of you with me, and everywhere I am there you'll be. And everywhere I am there you'll be. Thank you, Mandy. That was beautiful. Would everyone please rise for the laying of our wreath? Commander Arquella? The wreath is being presented by Sergeant Kendall Arquella. Please be seated. Thank you. It is now my honor to ask the Board of Directors and our speakers and chaplain to please take their places in the front of the table. As has become our custom, we try each year to remember an officer in the past who was killed in the line of duty. This year, we have three. First is Lieutenant Robert Greer from the Oregon State Penitentiary, the Oregon Department of Corrections. Lieutenant Greer was murdered on April 7, 1972, when he was stabbed while trying to disarm an inmate in an altercation with another inmate. He is survived by his son, Randy Greer, and grandsons, Alex and Zachary, 
and an extended family. Next is Correctional Officer Gary Rao from the Metropolitan Correctional Center in San Diego, California. Correctional Officer Gary Rao discovered an escape attempt taking place and tried to intervene. He was assaulted by a group of inmates and beat it, beaten repeatedly. He died on February 7, 1983 from massive head injuries without regaining consciousness. He is survived by his son Gary Rao Jr. and his daughter Lisa Rao Schroeder. Group Supervisor Leslie Macaro from the Youth Training School in Chino, California. On May 20th, 1988, Group Supervisor Macaro and another correctional employee from the Youth Training School escorted three inmates to the Los Angeles Medical Center for treatment. As they attempted to make their departure, one of the inmates bolted to escape while in full restraints. Supervisor Magaro began a foot pursuit and was struck by a moving vehicle driven by a, driven by a civilian hospital employee. Supervisor Macaro died an hour later from his injuries. Group Supervisor Macaro is survived by his wife Martha, sons Mark, Paul, John, and daughter Carrie. This year we have a new presentation to make, remembering our military officers killed in the line of duty while serving our country. First we have Marine Corps Lance Corporal Marcus M. Cherry from Imperial, California. He was assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, 1st Marine Division, 1st Marine Expeditionary Force out of Camp Pendleton, California. Lance Corporal Cherry was killed April 6, 2004 by hostile fire in an outburst of violence between insurgents and U.S. troops in the Al-Anabar province, Iraq. Lance Corporal Cherry is the son of Correctional Officer Genevieve King of Sentinella State Prison in California. Marine Private First Class Christopher J. Reed. PFC Reed from Craigmont, Idaho, was assigned to 3rd Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment, 1st Marine Division, 1st Marine Expeditionary Force out of Camp Pendleton, California. PFC Reed was killed July 10, 2004, in a non combat related vehicle accident in the Al Ain Bar province in Iraq. PFC Reed is the son of Correctional Officer Keith Reed of Northern Idaho Correctional Institution, Idaho. PFC Reed's family was unable to attend. These things will be delivered to him by one of our field representatives. Marine Lance Corporal Brandon P. Ramey. Lance Corporal Ramey was from Boone, Illinois, assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 24th Marine Regiment, 4th Marine Division, Marine Corps Reserve from Chicago, Illinois. Lance Corporal Ramey was killed on November 8, 2004 by enemy action as troops rushed to retake the insurgent stronghold in Babil Province, Iraq. Lance Corporal Ramey is the son of Correctional Officer Randy Ramey of Valley State Prison for Women in California. A 
Army Staff Sergeant James D. Malrus, who also was a correctional officer at the United States Medical Center for Federal Prisoners at the MCFP Springfield. Staff Sergeant Malrus of Aurora, Mississippi, was assigned to the 805th Military Police Company, Army Reserve, out of Raleigh, North Carolina, and was killed when a weapons cache exploded on January 29, 2004, in Afghanistan. Staff Sergeant Maurus is survived by his wife, Michelle Maurus, son Craig, and daughter Mackenzie. They were unable to attend today, excepting for the family are Ron Mal Rob Botten and Sherry Everhart. Next, we have Army Staff Sergeant Stacy C. Brandon, who also was a senior correctional officer at the Federal Correctional Institution in Forest City. Staff Sergeant Brown Brandon of Hazen, Arkansas, was assigned to the 39th Support Battalion, 39th Brigade Combat Team, 1st Cavalry Division, Army National Guard, out of Hazen, Arkansas, when he was killed on April 24, 2004, when mortar rounds hit his camp in Taji, Iraq. Staff Sergeant Brandon is survived by his wife, April, son, Jonathan, and daughter, Brianna. The Roll Call of Fallen Officers. Deputy Sheriff Christopher Berger, Bradford County Sheriff Department, Tawanda, Pennsylvania. On March 31, 2004, Deputy Sheriff Christopher Berger went out to a home with his partner, Deputy Sheriff Michael Van Curren, in a rural county to serve a bench warrant on a male subject, a sentenced criminal and his girlfriend on previous drug charges and to take them into custody and transport them back to the jail. Deputy Burgett and Deputy Van Curren were both ambushed upon arrival at the site by gunfire and died of multiple gunshot wounds. Deputy Sheriff Burgett is survived by his wife Kimberly and his son Christian. His father and stepmother Paul and Dorothy Burgett his mother and stepfather Mar Margo and Ronald Davidson, four stepsisters, two stepbrothers. In Pennsylvania, deputy sheriffs double as correctional officers in the jail. Deputy Sheriff Berger. His partner on that very fateful day Deputy Sheriff Michael Van Curren. Deputy Sheriff Van Curren is survived by his wife Elaine Van Curren, his son Andrew, his daughter Tiffany, and extended family members. Deputy Sheriff Robert Goodwin, Clark County Sheriff Department, Quitman, Mississippi. Deputy Sheriff Robert Goodwin was killed on April 6, 2004, when he was struck and killed by a vehicle while supervising an inmate road crew. It was Deputy Goodwin's second day on the job before the accident. Deputy Goodwin also worked part-time for the Enterprise Police Department. Deputy Goodman... Goodwin is survived by his son, Robert Steve Goodwin, a booking jailer at the Sheriff's Department, daughters Lynn Gray and Vicki Moore, grandsons Winston Gray and Taboris Keeler, and granddaughters Shatterina Kay and Shawanda K. Gray, and extended family members. Deputy Sheriff Goodman. Nurse Tammy Watts from the Wyoming Honor Farm, Wyoming Department of Corrections. 
nurse Tammy Watts was murdered by an inmate on April 15, 2004, while she was setting up the morning medication line. While working alone performing her duties, the inmate assaulted and strangled her. Nurse Tammy Watts is survived by her husband Lee Watts, sons Dusty, Bobby, Josh, daughter Tori, and mother Linda Hart, and extended family members. Correctional Officer Steve Carroll from the Stephenson County Sheriff Department in Freeport, Illinois. Correctional Officer Carroll suffered a fatal heart attack on April 23, 2004 after struggling with an unruly prisoner in one of the courtrooms. He collapsed moments after physically removing the prisoner from the courtroom and placing him in a holding cell. Officer Carroll is survived by his wife, Becky Carroll, twin daughters Cheryl and Mandy, and granddaughter Hannah, and extended family members. Correctional Officer John Quinn from the Delaware Correctional Center, Delaware Department of Corrections. Correctional Officer Quinn died on April 30, 2004 from a serious vehicle accident. After a scuffle with an inmate, he initially felt okay and later was en route to the hospital to seek treatment when the accident occurred. He is survived by his wife Anita Quinn and his mother Jackie Deegan. Correctional Officer Scott Bryant from the Iowa State Pres Penitentiary, Iowa Department of Corrections. Correctional Officer Bryant was struck and killed on May 17, 2004 by a vehicle while officially representing the Iowa Department of Corrections during a Special Olympics law enforcement torch run. An elderly driver passed a security patrol car that was following the runners in the torch run and re-entered the roadway. Officer Bryant, seeing the approaching car, pushed another correctional officer out of the way a split second before being struck, which saved the other officer's life. Officer Bryant is survived by his wife, Mickey, and daughters, Brooke and Bailey. Probation Officer Eugene Tal Groover from Hinesville Probation Office, Georgia Department of Corrections. Probation Officer Groover died on July 9, 2004, while he was in a defensive tactics training exercise when he suffered a fatal heart attack. He is survived by his wife, Denise, also a probation officer, his daughter, Jennifer, sons, Jason, Reed, and Hagen, and his mother, Judy. Parole Officer Louise Partiger from the Yellowknife Parole Officer, Northwest Territories, Correctional Services, Canada. Parole Officer Pargetter was stabbed to death on October 6, 2004 in the Northwest Territories as she made a working visit to a violent sex offender's home. The parolee killed her in his apartment because he was upset that the officer had previously revoked 
his parole some months earlier. This was her first home visit to him since he was re-paroled. She is survived by her partner, Anne Laidney, her baby daughter, Neva, and her sons, Mike and Judy Pargeter. Correctional Officer Marcella Coleman from the Coran Farmhold Correctional Facility, Philadelphia Prison System in Pennsylvania. Correctional Officer Coleman died on October 9, 2004 in a firebombing of her home along with five other family members sleeping at the time of the bombing. The bombing was in retaliation for a family member testifying in a drug-related court case. Those perishing in the bombing were Officer Coleman's 12-year-old grandson, Taij Portia, 34-year-old daughter, Tamika Nash, 10-year-old granddaughter, Khadijah Nash, 15-year-old grandson, Sean Anthony, and 15-month-old grandson, Dimir Jenkins. Officer Coleman is survived by her daughter, Regina Nash, also a correctional officer at the Curran Farmhold Correctional Facility as well as extended family members. Clerk Rhonda Osborne from the Connolly Unit, Texas Department of Criminal Justice. Clerk Osborne was assaulted by an inmate on October 21, 2004 in the unit storage office and was strangled to death. The inmate then took his own life. Ms. Osborne is survived by her daughter, Brooklyn, her parents, Meredith and Thomas Dworczyk, and her brother, Steve Dworczyk, and extended family members. Lieutenant Robert Haley from the Comanche County Sheriff Department, Comanche, Texas. Lieutenant Haley was killed on October 28, 2004 from blunt force trauma in a serious vehicle accident while transporting an inmate from Abilene to Comanche. The vehicle he was driving veered onto the shoulder and into the opposing lane where Lieutenant Haley was hit by an oncoming SUV. Lieutenant Haley is survived by his wife, Billy D., his son, Robert Haley, Jr., and his daughter, Carrie Guerra, who also works for the Sheriff Department as a jailer. Lieutenant Haley is also survived by numerous grandchildren and extended family members. Correctional Officer Manuel Gonzalez, California Institution for Men, California Department of Corrections in Chino, California. Correctional Officer Gonzalez was brutally murdered by a convict on January 10, 2005, while performing his duties in the unit by an inmate released from his cell. He died of multiple stab wounds later in the hospital. He is survived by his parents, Manuel and Bertha Gonzalez, his sons Mark, Stephen, Little Manuel, and Gustavo, his daughters Roxana and Jessica, his fiance Tanya Cuerda, his brother David, sister Rosalina, and a very large extended family of aunts, uncles, and cousins, the family of R Manuel Gonzalez. Would everyone please rise for the 21-gun salute and the playing of taps.
Please be seated. I'd like to ask Chaplain Tony ask you to come forward. We have been challenged by Glenn, our chairman, to hug our families each day. We have been reminded that we lay, our life, we lay our lives down for our friends. And today, we've honored those who lay their lives down for strangers. We give thanks for God's love that has been displayed and shown today from the Correctional Peace Officers Foundation to show our love that we care. Let's bow our heads and give thanks. We thank you, Lord, for this day of remembrance. We thank you for the mementos. We thank you for all the sharing. Once again, we ask that your strength would guide us, govern us, and keep us. We take one day at a time as we look to you for our help and our strength. Bless us, we pray, in the name of our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. Would everyone please rise for the retrieval of colors? Commander?